Hello and welcome to our Tuesday night, June 16th, 2020 talk about Gone West, the Astral and Spirit Planes Compared. And this, of course, is the book by J.S.M. Ward as he traveled astrally through his father-in-law into the spirit plane and everything he saw. He did this in the early 1900s, 20th century. First, I want to tell you, please hit the bell, subscribe, tell your friends about our live streaming on our YouTube channel. I am no longer on Kardec Radio on Sunday nights or Kardec Radio Facebook page. I've decided to do live stream YouTube channels on both Sunday nights and Tuesday nights. They're going to be at the same time. They're going to be at 5 p.m. Eastern um, time zone. Of course, all the other time zones around the world, 2 p.m. in the afternoon Pacific and, you know, and 6 p.m. in in uh, Rio de Janeiro. So in, wherever you live, look off, off of 5 p.m. Of course, if you hit the bell on the YouTube channel, you'll be notified when uh, we are going to go live. So again, please give your comments. I appreciate everybody saying hi. I won't answer those. I don't want to ruin the continuity of what I'm talking about. But if you have questions, I will certainly try and answer those questions as I get a break in the narrative. Or if, you know, if it's very pertinent, I'll go right to it. So anyway, Let's start. This is very interesting, uh, and you can get this book, Gone West. I have a link to it down, at, you know, not right now. As soon as I finish this video and I add to it after it's live, I'll put a link to it. It's also, I'll have a link on my on my site, nwspiritism.com. This is in PDF. You can read it for free. It's fascinating. That's why I wanted to go through it, uh, what this person shows about the spirit world. And this is why I like to do these type of books, because Spiritism, codified by Alan Kardec in 1850s, tells us so much. And yet I like to see what other people say. And then well, how does Spiritism explain? Where, do they, where are they maybe a little off? And how do they see things? Maybe it's the same, but they just say it in different language so we can understand more what Spiritism is telling us. So this is chapter 23. And this is where he compares going to his father-in-law's room, HJL, it calls him, the astral and spirit plane. So he says he he traveled through space, and then he entered HJL's room. And I asked him, what do you consider is the exact difference between a man on the astral plane and one on the spiritual? And HJL, who's been in the spirit world for a while, not, not for a long time, he, go, he goes, I understand what you mean. On the astral plane, we are still to a certain extent material. We have, as it were, an etherealized material body. The astral plane consists of particles of very fine matter, much more etherealized, of course, than the gross atoms of Earth, but still matter. They stand somewhat in the same relation to the ordinary physical world that gas is due to solids on Earth. Says so this material body being so ethereal is of course much more completely dominated by the spirit for good or evil. It is the same thing with the astral landscape. In the spirit plane, however, matter has for all intents and purposes have been left behind. Behind It is with our forms that we close our souls and the landscape and buildings which you see now before you are the forms of those things when on earth. Thus it is when we wish to become visible, even to the clairvoyant upon earth, we usually have to close ourselves with a temporary astral form, just as to make ourselves visible to ordinary folk. We have to materialize a temporary physical body. Mind you, there are cl clairvoyants you can see into the sixth plane. You are one, but most clairvoyants cannot. Even when a clairvoyant can, better results are often obtained by our clothing ourselves with an astral form. So I believe what he's doing, and we'll go later, and when he talks about astral and spiritual. So what spiritism tells us is the higher you go in the levels of heaven, the less, the higher the ratio of energy to matter. So therefore on earth, we are very high percentage matter, the high ratio of matter. And as you go higher and higher, you become less matter and more energy. 
Now, every spirit has a spirit form, but then there's a paraspirit, and I'll go on this, this later, that kind of covers your form as you think it should be. And so I, and so I think he's thinking that a spirit plane is where he is in heaven, where you have your own spirit form. But then when you're down on earth, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, when he's talking about the astral plane, it's a little bit more dense, right? The lower you go, the denser it is. It's still etherealized when you're not in the physical incarnation, but you are less dense. Let's go on. And then so JW says, in dreams, do we come to the astral or to the spiritual plane? Or sometimes the one, sometimes the other. And HAL says, dreams are of many orders. Some are purely the invention of the human brain. They may be little more than the thoughts of the day worked over and redigested by the brain or at night. Or they may be pure fiction, similar to the stories children tell themselves for amusement. The very materialistic have dreams of those two orders, and most people at times have some of these. But many persons enter the astral plane, what they think are dreams, and a few but very few enter the spirit plane. So this kind of shows is that when what I was saying is that when people sleep, they go to where they're comfortable, where they can't. If they're at a, at a low spiritual level, they're not going to go into any of the levels of heaven. Where if you're at a higher level, you can go into the levels of heaven, but you have to be more spiritual. I'll carry on what he said. You do so, but the reason is that you are mediumistic and still more important because I call you. Very few have such a privilege, even those who do seldom bring away so clear a recollection. We help you to remember, but it is true that experiences on the spirit plane, appertaining to the spirit as they do, seem to remain attached to the spirit and are more vivid than those of the astral plane, which, being more akin to earth life, become distorted as the astral reunites with the physical. It is, it is as if the physical brain attempted to explain astral phenomena by physical laws and largely failed, but recognized the hopelessness of trying to do so with the spiritual. So he says it pretty well, what spiritism tells us. When we go and leave our bodies or we have dreams and we go into the spiritual plane, we, we cannot, or we have our spirit brain. We, we understand everything's going on. But of course, we have that paraspirit, which is a connection. It's a, you know, a, let's call it a tube or a, you know, a, a ethernet connection, but it's a very limited bandwidth. And it's limited because your physical brain, you're used to your, your senses, limited as they are, and you're used to, you know, 3D, height, width, and length, and time. And in this, and in the spirit plane, your time is part of what you see, right? There is no time per se. You can see the future. You can see the data of how it's going to transmit over different states. So, and even distance is funny, right? Because there's, as we're told by spirits, there's no distance per se. There's absence or it's there, right? There's this, there's only two things. It's, it's, it's present, it's present here, or it's absent. Because you remember your thought is action and everything around you is a, is a construction of thought. Now, it's not like many people say that your whole, when you go to spirit plane, everything is constructed out of your thoughts. No, you conform because you're, you're usually a less superior spirit, right? You're not as the higher order of these with dominant thoughts. And there's other spirits that are thinking the same thing. So you automatically kind of get into that stream of thought. And so the buildings look how, how they look. So I think that's what he's saying. So, and it makes sense. So, he, you know, it's like your brain can't, your brain, it, it can't handle seeing this different thing. It's just like you going to a, a alien world and coming back and trying to describe it in what language, right? Well, how are you going to describe the things you see when you have no idea? It's like when people have NDEs, I say, I've been to this place and I don't know how to describe it. And there's, I just remember this one woman has these, she saw this like brightly colored rock, right? And of course, in the spirit world, I've read descriptions of that, which is it's it's a liquid stone 
that, that shines, lights, and change colors, which is, you know, very, very strange. And, and even the trees will change colors or they'll have different music, depending on who goes by them. Now, we have, this is, again, you know, the spirit world knows this. We're, you know, with all the movies we see in CGI, computer-generated uh, graphics, right, is you will, we're able to, to, um, go into this, this different thinking of, of seeing these fantastic things, right? Remember, the most of, the, of the, the history of the world, you didn't see anything like this. And we're used to seeing really strange things on, on the screen. And now I think people are, are, can have a better way of interpreting their dreams and their recollections and visions when they're in a the spirit plane. So let's carry on what he said. Far more people on the astral planes go to it in their sleep. They come wandering along, they're friends of it, as it were, often apparently half dazed, as if their connection with their bodies rendered them only partly conscious of the astral world in which they moved. The astral body, of course, is often unable to leave the physical body owing to the gross immaterial life such people live. And even when they can get out of the physical, it cannot or dare not go any distance from it. Perhaps you'd like to see some of these visitors at the edge of the astral plane. So, so sure, okay. So now we'll go to the planes where the worlds meet. So he's probably looking at where he's getting to the umbral, where the and where the umbral is the begins at the surface of the earth, goes up to the levels of heaven, and the dark abyss or purgatory is as our hell, as some people call it, but there's no eternal hell, is below the earth's crust. He goes, now we'll go to the earth, to the plane where the world's meet. First, I have to close myself in my astral body. He goes, well, what about me? Don't I need an astral body? He goes, he goes yeah, where did you leave yours? He goes, I don't know. Do you think it'll be with my physical? He's, and then HL said, we better ask our guardian spirits. And as he spoke, a light appeared behind him, growing stronger and stronger, till I could barely look at it. And as it grew stronger, it took on the form, the glorious spirit I had seen before. And he says, go back and fetch from your bed your astral body. Now, what did he mean by that? Let's talk about what he meant by astral body. And I think that the medium went there in his spirit without taking his paraspirit. Oh, so here's, um, let me, let's show this comment. This might be, in my, this is, in my most advanced meditation, I can see 360 degrees if my eyes are closed and all my senses come alive. Our brains are programmed on learning life to learn it again. It's very tough, but not impossible. So again, this is a great comment. So what does this mean? So this shows that this shows that we are limited by our physical bodies and in your 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 spirit. So this person who is meditating is really meditating and, and they're seeing with their spirit and they can see all around them. This is how it, it, the spirit world tells us we can only see one eighth of around us. Now I'm not talking just the focus of the vision, but lights, sounds, senses, everything. And so this person commenting is getting a taste of, of what is, is being shown into of the possibility of when that person is a spirit. Now let's carry on more about the paraspirit and the spirit body, because I think this is, should be interesting to many people. So, and it's all kind of part of, it includes how reincarnation works too. So we're going to get some good information here. So how can we know who we are in successive lives in the spirit world? And the answer is the paraspirit. The paraspirit is the part of us that combines, and what I think he's saying, the astral body in this book, Gone West, combines our body at birth and detaches from our physical body upon death. And if you see people of NDEs and people who sometimes will have astral plane, they'll see like a silver cord as they'll leave and a silver cord will still be attached to their body. That's your, that's your a connection of your paraspirit. So we are our paraspirit until we reach the level of a pure spirit when at such time we become pure energy. And of course, there are more detailed explanations. And you can look in other spirits' books and in my books. But right now, let's, let's go to 
um, kind of give you a summary. So in the book Between Heaven and Earth, there's a quick summary of how the para-spirit controls our physical body. Now think of the para-spirit as it's a diving suit around your physical body and it, it goes into each cell. And there's a connection to your, your spirit, which is always in the spirit plane, but it's connected to your body through the para-spirit. And that's what I was saying, this, this, poor, this poor bandwidth, right? When you go into the astral plane and you're really uh, seeing things with your, with your spirit and you can't interpret very much and your dream's all confused, that's because your physical brain can only understand so much. So there, in this passage below, there's a team of spirits examining a male spirit named Julio, right? Julio, who poisoned himself. And so even as the spirit, because of his brain, he, his throat is an area of pain. So the team leader, Corinto, explains this, this person's problems. Even though he's discarnated, he still feels this pain. And so this is what he says. Whatever the corruption of thought is, such will be the disharmony in the particular force center that reacts in our body to this or that class of mental inflow. Now let's apply earthly terminology to our short lesson as much as possible so that you can better grasp what we are saying. As we analyze the physiology of this paraspirit, we may classify its force centers by remembering the most important areas of the physical body. This using the best expression for the vehicle that serves us presently is the crown center, which on earth is considered by Hindu philosophy as being the thousand petal lotus and the most important center of all due to its high radiation potential and its connection with the mind, the signing sheet, seat of the conscious. So this person who told me that they could see all around, around them what was really concentrating in their spirit on their crown center, right? And this was the, 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 the kind of the, the, the dominant center that this person is using at that point in time. And of course, the crown center receives, first of all, the stimuli of the spirit commanding other centers and vibrating with them in the perfect system of inter interdependence. And considering our exposition the for the phenomena of the physical body, and I'm quoting now, and satisfying the imperatives of simplicity in our definitions, we can say that the energies of nourishment for the nervous system and its subdivisions emanate from the center, providing all the electromagnetic resources that are indispensable for organic stability. Therefore, it is the great assimilator of the solar energies and rays from the higher realms that can favor the sublimation of the soul. Next, there is the cerebral center, contiguous to the sound crown center, which orders the various types of perception with, within it, the physical body comprises sight, hearing, touch, and the vast network of the processes of the mind that have to do with speech, learning, art, and knowledge. It is in the cerebral center that we possess the command of the doctrine center, which has to do with psychic powers. Next is the throat center, which presides over the vocal phenomena, including the activities of the thymus, the thyroid, and the parathyroid. Then there is the heart center, which sustains the services of the emotions in overall equilibrium. Let me stop there for a second. In the Spirit's book, they're saying, what, what is dominant in a person? Which of these centers is dominant? And what they're saying is that people who are more intellectual will a lot of the time will stay in the crown center or in the cerebral center. And people who feel the emotions like empaths will have most of their force in the, in the heart center. And yet everything's important, but that was just an interesting uh, observation I saw in the spirits book today. So then I'll keep quoting. So proceeding on down is the splenic center, which in the dense body is seated in the spleen and regulates the dis uh, distribution of your gastric indexes. So let me see if I have a picture of the crown center. I think I do. No, I don't. I wish I did. I'll have to bring that up next time so people can see that because it's a, it's a very good illustration. So here's the, here's the review of what, what he's saying. He says there's, there's the four centers, which are also call, called the chakras, a little bit different name that you'll see versus what we have uh, versus 
that you'll see yeah that you have people from india that hindus have but there's the crown center commands all the other centers stimuli of the spirit assimilation distributes solar energies and electric electromagnetic uh resources there is the um uh, cerebral center which will take the brain yes and then there's the cerebral center which is the brain and the uh how it interprets interprets things and things like that and then let me carry on there is the throat center let me look up just find this this picture for you there we go because this is fascinating and it shows you how the other religions really understood here we go i got it really understood how things work and how much they were shown let me have to make there there you are so you'll see there's a lot of similarity with the crown center uh and then they say the cerebral center, which is control sense site, which they say is the third eye chakra, then the throat center. And of course, you know, that these people have all talked, you know, throughout ages in the Hindu philosophy, throughout ages, they've talked to spirits and they've learned these things. And then there's the throat center, they say, the heart center, they call it the heart chakra, the splenic center, which they call it the same thing, the... Uh, the gastric, what they call it, the solar plexus chakra, and then the root chakra, which is, they call that the genetic center, which controls the sex and allows stimulus of your body. So again, this is, this is showing you information that was given to us by spirits, right? And then these are this was done in 1850s to Allan Kardec, who codified spiritism. He was the codifier of spiritism. And it was promised to us in the New Testament by Jesus. He says, I'm going to give you the spirit of truth to give you more information. Why is he giving us more information at this point in time? Because things like the Hindu philosophy, the Hindu religion has told us many important things. But now we're being told more because we are technologically and culturally ready to get more information. Imagine Jesus coming in. You know, in the you know where he, when he came one A.D. and said, "Well, you know, everything you think is just, is really a construct, and there's just this huge matrix up there, and that's why you should forgive everybody and be nice to everyone, no matter you know what sexual persuasion they are." And people would have just stoned him to death, right? What Spiritism tells us is be good to everybody. You're going to go through reincarnations. So let me carry on and keep me maybe, maybe stay on on point. But I'm just telling you why we're being told what we are now. So therefore, the paraspirit, which covers our body, is composed of seven major centers, all working in concert to regulate our spiritual and physical bodies. So you can imagine the paraspirit lying as a translate, transparent layer, like on top of our bodies, and it goes into our bodies, connected to our material organs. Now, our soul, our spirit, of course, it radiates, right? It's not It's not like there's a definite boundary because we have this power of radiation all around us. But this this is so important because it's, it, when it's connected to everything, it helps guide and heal and regulate our physical life. And the connection is a two-way street. As we live and learn in our bodies, the parent spirit absorbs feedback, allowing it to transfer the knowledge gained in our present life to be used in the spirit world in our subsequent lives. Yes, yeah, so there's another one. So again, as, as, as has been told, is the chakras were pivotal in my awakening. So yes, because that is, you have gotten a, uh, you know, you've gotten in touch with a very important part of your spirit and that and in, in your paraspirit as another example if on all your previous lives your paraspirit holds every language you've ever learned in your previous lives and therefore if you are talking to another spirit and they're not high enough level to to talk through telepathy and they're speaking some other dialect but if you've lived in that area at some previous life 
the paraspirit would automatically trans translate for you. So there's just there are just great um, interesting things about the paraspirit. Now, when we're when I give you this example, this person that, that committed suicide by doing his throat, the damage of the paraspirit also explains a lot why people come back with severe disabilities. Because if, let's say, you killed yourself and you threw yourself under a train, and look at, you know, look at the diagram here of all of this paraspirit, and, and imagine the destruction that paraspirit has. Now, if you die when you were supposed to die, that doesn't happen, right? Even if you were supposed to be blown up in some explosion, because at that moment in time, your paraspirit knew to withdraw at that right, at that right moment. But if you did something dramatic to yourself, you would completely harm your paraspirit, just like this person did when they committed suicide by poison. And a lot of times people have to come back as very severely, God bless them all, disabled for them to repair their paraspirit. And sometimes uh, a baby will come back and just live, you know, a week or a day or, or a couple of hours just to get that paraspirit so it has that better form again. That's why it's so important to take care of your body because your paraspirit remembers everything. And of course, your paraspirit sends all the data, all your emotions and your thoughts to your spirit brain. So when you pass over and you leave this dense body and you're into this better world, you forget nothing, right? You, you are who you are. You remember everything. So, so let's go back and see what happens to Julio. So he's the one, as I said, he, he poisoned himself. So, and so this is what Clarenzo says about this. He goes, when acts contrary to the divine law, our mind harms the harmony of one of our soul's four centers. It is naturally enslaved to the effects of the unbalancing action, thus making the toil of readjustment necessary. In Julio's case, he is the author, <clears throat> sorry, he is the author of the disturbance in the throat center and the alteration expressed by the infirmity or imbalance that necess by necessity go with him in reincarnation. So what he's being told is when he's born, he'll have to live with a pain in his throat and he'll have to heal himself by correcting the vibrat vibratory tonus of the throat center. So he'll be reborn in a defective body. And he'll suffer from that, well, you know, that his throat. And he will have, he'll have like a lot of uh, sore throats uh, and things like that. So he, he will not have a good time of it. He won't be, you know, horrible, but he'll, he'll suffer from a lot from, you know, as, as, as people do from sore throats and other things will happen all in this throat area. And that's why deficiencies are carried over from us from one life to the next. And that's why it's so important to de-stress yourself and keep all your, your chakras, all your force centers in harmony. Because when your force centers are not in harmony and the, when you are stressed, they're not in harmony. And one, one will be stressed and one will be, and the, the messages from your crown center to all the rest will be, will be, severely affected and they won't be as effective in healing what you have and that's what happens when when you have passes done for you in a spirit center is they will send there will be a spirit behind this person giving you passes no they don't touch you directly but they'll take the universal fluid and they'll use that person's body to make it to the fluid that will fit you and try to reharmonize your centers and that's why you know, you say, well, how, how do I harmonize my centers? Well, first of all, follow your conscience. Become less stressed. Stop worrying about things. If you follow your conscience and you do the right thing, and even though it doesn't make you as much profit, right? If you do the right thing, you will be so much more relaxed. You won't have the stress. Believe me. It, it long, it, the longer I've been a, a spiritist, the least stress I have, the more calm I am, and I think the healthier I am. In fact, I've done studies with people who have more spirituality, are healthier, and live longer. 
So, uh, so again, even Socrates knew this, who was a precursor of Christ. He says, you know, everything in moderation, nothing in ex excess. So, now I know a lot of what I'm saying is contradicts all that we modern humans have learned. We are told that sickness is caused by viruses, bacteria, and other environmental factors, not our own behavior. Well, to believe, and you know, and then to believe so puts us back in the era of superstition. And then back then when an ailment occurred, the first thing a person would ask is, why is God punishing me? Or why did I, what did I do wrong to deserve this? So are we then supposed to ask when a bad illness strikes us, what should I improve in my life to not have this occur again? And the answer is, is a qualified yes. So first, let me explain this. The spirit world knows all and each of the effect of our scientific advances, what can be cured and what can't be cured given our current state of medicine. And we are programmed into this life to experience trials, and each trial is arranged with whatever assistance we may have from medicine at the present day taken into account. Now, your life has more meaning and complexities than you at first realize. There are levels of the spirit world that helps and hinders us. And so what we need to do is understand how our trials affect us and then for us to do as best possible is always keep our four centers, our chakras, in harmony. And that will help us get perfect equilibrium and help us ascend in the spirit world. So, according to what Clarencio says, as he talked about this Julio, he says, what are the main causes of our diseases? And this is what he said. Pride, vanity, tyranny, selfishness, laziness, and cruelty are vices of the mind that generate disturbances and disease in its instrument of expression. So really what happens is that by weakening and stressing your, 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 your chakras and your force centers, you're destroying your own body's ability to fight against illnesses. So, and so you're, what you're doing is, is your body is a machine. Now, in, in the spirit's book, it says, they ask a question, what would a, a physical body be without a soul, a spirit into it? And it said, it'd just be a mass of nothing. And, and that's what we are, right? We think we are just our physical body, but that's not true. We are more than our physical body. We have our perispirit, which is then really, which is all those, those seven crown centers, those chakras that is into our physical body. That's always helping us. It's fighting diseases. It's, it's, it's also, if your trial says, and you should have like some sort of cancer at one point in time or some other type of, of medical problem that you signed up in a trial before you were incarnated, it will be responsible for that at the right time. In fact, there was a story in, in the spiritist literature of a person who was going to have a really bad ulcer when he was in his mid-50s because he had stabbed someone in the stomach in a previous life and therefore he was going to have that. His pure spirit has a timer and it's going to happen, right? But, so, yes, so there are things, are, and of course, as I said before, studies show the more spiritual you are, the healthier you are. And, I, and that's what it, really what that means is the more you're in touch with your paraspirit and your spirituality, the more you heal yourself. Um, and I'm not saying don't I'll always go to a doctor and get, get help, but I'm just saying it. everything is connected. And so when during our life here on earth, we persist in the sins of selfishness and other bad behavior, the effect carries on in our paraspirit. Whatever we did incorrect will harm one or more of our four centers, causing a breakdown in the harmony of our paraspirit. And so, Lorenzo says, the effects and the remedy, says, infirmity as disharmony of the spirit continues on in the paraspirit. Known diseases, in addition to others that have escaped human diagnosis, will persist for a long, long time in the tormented spheres of the soul, leading us to readjustment. 
Pain is a great blessed remedy. It re-educates your mental activity, restructuring the pieces of our instrumentation and polishing the anemic centers that our mind uses to develop itself on the journey toward eternal life. So what he's saying, when he's saying pain is a great blessed remedy, what he's saying pain is the emotional pain, maybe sometimes physical pain that we go through in our trials and tribulations during each incarnation that provides the, the stimuli to change our character so we aren't as selfish and jealous and thirst for revenge as we were before. And the more we can take out those primitive emotions, the healthier and the higher spiritual level we will be. So I hope that helps it, to show the importance of the para-spirit and what we were talking about. So let's carry on with uh, the adventures of JLM. So then he went back and got his astral body, which is really this para-spirit. And he stepped inside his bedroom and I, he, you know, he suddenly appeared clothed with a more substantial body than the moment before I had possessed. And I'm quoting now. So yet my physical body still lay asleep in my bed. I turned at the sound of H.A.L.'s voice and saw that he too looked different. For one thing, he looked older. In the spirit world, he appeared a great deal younger than when on earth. Here he looked stronger, but not so much very younger. There was a more subtle difference, but I don't know how to describe it. And then H.A.L. said, well, this is not my own astral body. That disintegrated as soon as I died, as I told you. This is only a temporary body made out of the astral elements which are floating about. I've done my best to impress my form upon it as I remembered upon earth. Now come with me. So what he really did is his mind subconsciously, he didn't quite, HL at that point in time hadn't had enough experience to know that, that well, he is fashioning his paraspirit, he's fashioning the body as he thinks it should be. Okay, so. Oh, and I want to show this one to before I, I okay, this is a good point. And I'll me do a quick little plug here for the uh, spirits book. So what I've done is I'm reading the spirits book uh, in an audio book. And I have it on my site, nwspiritism.com. I'm lo uploading each chapter on YouTube. And then on my spite site, nwspiritism.com, I will have uh, book one. I have book one and I have it in MP3 format, but I also have it in M MP, um, I think it's M4B format, which is the iTunes format. And you can download it. It's a huge file just for book one. It's an hour and 20 minutes, but you can download it from there because I have it on a, like a Dropbox type place. And then from that, like an MP3 file, you can't skip chapters. But on the the like the iTunes compatible file, it's an audiobook that you can skip chapters, just like you can like an, an a music al album, right? Or what you're used to. So I'm glad that you reminded me of that. Thank you so much. Um, it's, good. it's there. It's book one. I'm I'm working. I do a little bit every day. There's there's a lot to go through there. So anyway, I'm sorry to. I'm going off in tangents today. It's so exciting. So anyway, he made his own astral body. Really what he did is he, his, his mind changed his, his uh, paraspirit. So he goes, I noticed the room seemed shadowy and semi-transparent. So did my body, which lay on the bed. And so indeed did all the earth phenomena. The body I now wore seemed, however, solid and real. And we passed through the shadowy walls with the slightest difficulty. And he said, I said there, H.A.L. says, Earth, Earth things and people now look to me as you do when I see you at Mrs. K's clairvoyantly. He goes, yes, I can quite believe that. There are many astral beings who cannot see the physical world for a long time after they have passed over, just as ordinary Earth drillers cannot see them. All the same, this double vision is a bit of a nuisance, so, that you, so, so will that you shall see only the astral plane. So again... This shows you the construct, the logical construct of the world. When in the great book, Memoirs of a Suicide, Camilo Branco, he saw the earth world, but and then he went from place to place. No one talked to him. That happens to people who die quite frequently. They die and they think they're still alive because they, they 
they say they have a body, just like, you know, HAL says, you know, says I, I have a body, but they're, they're on a different plane. They're on a, uh, they're a more etheric, uh, you know, gaseous type level than we are in our thick, dense molecular atomic structure. These people still are there. And then you can see both, right? You can see the astral, you can see the spirit world and the physical world, if that's what you're tuned into. And some people can do both. But, and that's why people, some people, and I've been in mediums meeting, were like, am I dead, right? And they, yeah, and they were brought to the mediums meeting so they would know that, yes, you know, you have passed over. And because it's, it's, you feel real. Because here's he said, I feel like I have a real body, but everything's different. Well, you're not as hungry, you're not as heavy. You can move by the speed of thought once you understand that and you learn how to do it. So there's a lot of great things about being on the other side. Really, when you understand spiritism, it's like death is really the main death is really to look forward to. You don't want to start it, but it's 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 a freedom from being in this dense, heavy body with all the pain that it entails, especially if you're going to go into the, one of the high levels of the spirit world. So then he says, all the same, this double vision is a bit of a nuisance. So he said, will that you only see the astral plane? And I did. And at once the shadowy house and landscape faded away. And HEL took my hand and said, quick, and they, we seem to be rushing through space. And it seemed neither dark nor light, but kind of between, which is about what is all said that as you go further and further down from the higher, the higher levels is very bright. And if sometimes you're so bright, unless you're higher spirit, you can't take it. It gets dimmer and dimmer. So he goes, here are some of the dreamers. And we waited. Now I could see the landscape very clearly for it seemed all gray and shrouded in mist. Exactly what spiritism says. The umbrow is gray and shrouded in mist and the, the deep dark abyss, which is under, which is they'll call purgatory is even darker. But he says, but I could perceive there were hills and dells and castles and woods and trees and wide expanses of water, but all was indistinct and gray. He goes, it's always like this, gray and shadowy. And HL replied, oh, dear, no, but you're more used to the spirit realms and so not attuned to these. But to many spirits who know no brighter place, this seems full of colors, but not even to all of them. This is a land of change, a halfway house, as it were, between the physical and spiritual plane. And really what it is, is it's it's one of the degrees as you go higher and higher. He goes, so the elements are ever changing. Now here have come a few of the visitors from Earth to us. And as he spoke, I noticed that large bands of spirits were floating towards us. Soon more and more passed swiftly by. Then it grew into a continuous stream. Sometimes they would come a crowd together, but other times they'd be spread out in ones and twos. Ever and anon across the stream of dreamers would float out a real density of the astral plane. It was easy to see the difference, but almost impossible to describe it in detail. However, one noticeable difference was that those still living on Earth had trailing away behind them a thread of light. These threads, unlike material threads, never came entangled as the astral beings moved about. It seemed as if each cord were able to pass through any other cord without severing it. That is the paraspirit cord again. So he's seeing this. That's a paraspirit cord attached to your physical body. So when you're dreaming, you see that paraspirit cord. Some people see it. Some people don't look back and, and they don't see it. It was very interesting. Shirley McLean said she had a, um, who for years I thought was, you know, didn't know what she's talking about. Now I understand she knows much more than I did. She had this vision one time and she she was in and she like went up, and, but she saw behind her this silvery cord. And the silvery cord is even talked about in the Bible. And so it, it's, it just shows you that people know this, right? I'm not telling you anything new that you could, wouldn't have known before, but it's, it's, everything's been so repressed and we we're in this culture where you believe these things, you're somehow inferior and not very intelligent. But actually, you're, you're, you understand that we know so little. The more I understand about spiritualism, the more I know I know nothing. And that we are, we are this physical 
in this physical body for a time to learn on earth. And there's just all of these great things happening around us and they all have a purpose. There's, there's no, spiritism tells us there's no such thing as a miracle. And when you understand spiritism, you understand, you know, people say, well, if God's around, why is all, if God loves us, why do so many terrible things happen? Why, why does good things happen to horrible people and bad things happen to great people? It's all explained because we are on this campus called earth and people are going through trials to change their personality and their character. And the stimuli that does it seems us to be sometimes unjust and cruel, but is exactly what they need in order to repair what they've done and maybe in previous lives. You don't know what that person did in, the, in their previous life, in their current life. They may be the most wonderful person in the world. But I will tell you, most of the times for someone who is advanced spiritually, they ask for that trial and tribulation in the spirit world because they wanted to repair something they had done wrong and they wanted to take that that piece of their personality and extract that primitive emotions and replace it with more advanced emotions. And that's why God never punishes. Spiritism tells us God doesn't punish anyone. It's everything is edifying. And I know that's really hard. When you look at our, our world now, I mean, it's a hard concept, but it, it all starts to make sense. It's all, it becomes organized as you see, see everything done and how close the spirit world is to us and how we are led from one trial to another. So let me carry on with, with, with what he said. There were many other differences and I perceive that many of them had their eyes shut and with their arms stretched out in front of them and they looked like people walking in their sleep. But not all were like this. Some had their eyes wide open and seemed to be hunting for someone. And a few seemed to be idly wandering through a strange landscape, stopping every now to gaze at it. Such a motley crowd of all ages, conditions, not only men, women, and children, but even animals. I saw a dog among the visitors who caught sight of a rabbit and once gave chase. He goes, now look at the dreams these people are dreaming and the friends they are seeking. And I notice a woman in front of her of front of her floated through a thought visualization of a little child. The thought seemed to float away from her and she kept following, crying bitterly. Then suddenly the real astral form of the child came running up. In a moment, the thought child was shattered, but the mother gave a glad cry and flung out her arms toward the astral, took it in her arms. She sat down there and then hugged the child and talked to it just as she would have done on earth. The child, a boy, appeared to be about six years old. So again, this is probably a woman who is trying to find her, her son who died probably when he was six. And he's in, the, he's in the spirit world. Now, some spirits, when they die, they'll come just be a mature spirit. Other spirits, when they die as a child, the spirit world, in order to help their personality and character mature in the correct manner, will let that, that child grow up in the spirit world. And so this woman was probably given this gift by the spirit world so she could make sure her boy was still good uh, and happy in the spirit world. And that is just a wonderful thing. And I've talked to people who've had dreams about their, their, their child who had passed away. And the spirit world is really tries to help many people with dreams and visions. And, he, and I'll quote again. Then I saw a man about 30 who came with his eyes wide open and evidently expecting to find someone. In a few moments, he was met by a young woman. Who are these? For I can see they are both alive upon earth. And H.A.L. said, I can't say who they are, but I can tell you this about them. That man is twin soul to that girl. He has not met her yet on earth, but he has on the astral plane. Whether they will meet on earth, I do not know, but I hope so. But look at that pair. So here was... Here was a, a man and woman who were soulmates in the spirit world. Now, as I, uh, I said in other videos, you may not be able to meet your soulmate. You, people have asked me, well, how, when will I ever meet my soulmate? I said, well, you may have one, but you may not be able to meet them in this life. It all depends on what you ask for in your trials. You know, there are instances, you know, I've met my soulmate and I was told, I'm married to her now. I was told that we had been married before. That's why I know she's my soulmate in previous lives, multiple times. But I've also read where some people aren't because sometimes when you are with your soulmate on earth, 
and you kind of, you know, use that. Let's give you an example. Like a man is using his his wife to fulfill his spiritual side, and but he's using her too much, and he's not really growing his spiritual side because he's lazy and has her, and therefore they say, okay. In fact, there's this, this one woman was saying, and there was a, a, a you know conversation in the spirit world, and she was talking to her husband. And goes, I think we can't be together in the next life. You know, you need to learn these type of lessons. And if I'm with you, you really won't learn them. And that may be happening to you, either a man or a woman. Uh, you won't, you know, you won't meet your soulmate. Even, you know, even could be another man, another woman, right? As, as we're told in the spirits book, love is between two spirits. You can come back as any sex you desire, male or female. But whatever is, sometimes you're not allowed to be together because you you, you, you know, oh, you know, I, I need to I need to grow on my own. I can't keep depending on another person. Most of the times when you're with your soulmate, you help each other grow. But I'm sure there's probably some avenues that doesn't work and so we just have to know that now you can say oh that's horrible and i have to go through my whole life without my soulmate well yes but we here on earth we think of a day a week 10 years 100 years as a long time it's a very short time remember you are an immortal soul you are going in life after life after life improving yourself so your time on earth is, is an infinitesimal amount of your immortal existence. It's like going to summer camp, camp for two or three weeks during summer and coming back home. When you're in summer camp, camp it seemed to you know, carry on forever, but it ended and you were back home. It's the same thing with your life on earth. You'll go back home and you'll be with your soulmate if you have one. Some people... They have so much, you know, and then other people will carry on and find others. I mean, it's all whatever you would like. So then he said, I saw a man and woman approach each other with delight, but floating near the woman was a thought from an el elderly man. Sorry. He goes, I knew by as instinct that this was the woman's husband whom she had married for money. While the younger man with whom she was now speaking was the man she really loved, but she had refused in order to marry the richer man. He goes, now look at these. So I, he I heard an agonized shriek and I saw one man pushed by another who had a knife in his hand. The hunted man kept looking over his shoulder and every now and then he gave a piercing shriek. His face was livid and his whole attitude betokened abject, abject fear. He goes, what does this mean? He goes, it's fairly obvious that for some reason the dark man considers he has been done a great wrong by the fair man. And when they meet on the astral plane, he acts as if he would like to act on earth. So this is, this is, you know, and as they said, in our dreams, when we're asleep, it's like we go back and get the oxygen of the spirit world. And for many of us, if we are higher spiritually, we go and we actually do tasks. We actually work during our time. Most of us, we are like this. We, we meet other people. We have pleasure. We have pain. We have these confused dreams uh, on in the astral plane and the umbrella. So, but then he says, and then HGL says, I can't say for certain, but I think each will retain some remembrance. And then JW, the, the medium goes, why? Well, it's it's the father. What on earth is he doing here? And he says, HGL says, that's hardly an appropriate exclamation. Why shouldn't your father come here? He's just dreaming like everyone else. Oh, his father will still be alive. Perhaps he'll recognize you. But he went past, busily engaged and seeking for someone and never seemed to see me and as he passed, I saw the thought form of his father floating before him. He goes, will he meet his father here? He goes, not very likely. He goes, he's comfortable in a different division. and not likely to come out here. He goes, but my father disappeared among the crowd. And for a moment, there was a law in the throng that were continually sweeping by us. I turned to HAL and said, does place exist in the astral plane in the same way it does on earth? And he says, to a certain extent, it has, but the landscape tends to correlate with the surface of the physical world. Thus, at the present minute, we're near London, which is why you see such a crowd of spirits. 
But the landscape tends to correlate. Our astral bodies are now bounded by time and space in the same way we are on Earth. We can rush from one part of the Earth to another in next to no time. Nor do the astral landscapes exactly correspond to landscapes on Earth. For there are, as it were, many layers, which as they said, there's many levels even in the embrow, because the same dis district at various periods of Earth history will present very different aspects. And for the example, the site of London has not held only prehistoric, prehistoric forests, but at times it's been covered by the ocean itself. So he goes on. So this is, this is a great example of, of the spirit world by, you know, by spirits. And so this is, this is, you know, is a, a, a glimpse from the book Gone West. And when I'm trying to interpret what Gone West has told us by what we have learned in spiritism. Now, if you'd like to know more about heaven and and the umbra, the lower zone, which they were describing as the astral plane, and even purgatory, which you know people some call hell, but it's really purgatory. There's no eternal punishment. Although some people who are there, they don't know it's not eternal, so they think it's eternal. That's probably what happened in previous times, during our pagan times, and so on and so forth. Is they say I'm, I'm punished for eternal, eternal punishment, and that's because they do not know that until they change their character and their attitude, they would be able to rise up. Because that is really what, what changes, right? It allows us to, to ascend in the spirit world is our, our spirituality, our quotient, is the amount of love, charity, fraternity, honesty we have in our hearts. And that's why on earth it's so important to emphasize these good characteristics and not only to emphasize these good characteristics on the surface on our surface and what we say through through words be, but because in the spirit world everyone reads your thoughts you're, you are an open book so it's really important to start changing your thought patterns when you go to work don't gossip about that person if you're, even though you don't like them say only nice things or say nothing at all and try to only think nice things or don't think about that person except how, pray for them to improve as you're walking down the street and you see you know some you know poor poor person on the street you know maybe drunk or sleeping don't say oh this is such a bum say that poor person made bad choices god bless them i hope you know i hope they get help in your mind tries to send out positive thoughts to everyone that you meet and try to do good if you can. I'm not saying that give away all your worldly goods or, you know, destitute yourself. No, the, the spirit world doesn't expect, they doesn't expect that. They don't want you to be a burden on others. You, so you'll need to work, take care of your family, all of that. But, you know, try to get your mind so you you raise your mind up a level. And as you do that, and as we showed you the chakras and the four centers, you will become more in harmony and you will become happier. You will become a much healthier and happier person. In fact, I go about this. I write about this in my book, How to Live Inner Peace Through Spiritism. And that is really is and it's a it's based upon this 24 steps. That like it's a poem with 24 very short verses what was given to us by the spirit Andre Luis to the wonderful medium Chico Xavier is what you need to do the change within yourself in order to really achieve this higher level of existence and and believe me when you when you start really concentrating and studying and working on yourself first you can be a little bit selfish that way right got to help yourself first and you can help others and actually by helping yourself you are being an example to others and you are helping others naturally without even doing anything but as you reach that pinnacle you'll get better and better and you will be more relaxed and the 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 vicissitudes of life the ups and downs you know the the financial calamities won't just be hitting you so emotionally hard anyway I want to say God bless to everyone 
and God bless to everybody. And remember, we are here every Sunday and Tuesday nights live on YouTube at 5 p.m. Eastern. God bless you.